The topic of the first uh, lecture will be on basically on hybrid simulation as we mostly perceive it in Europe. I'd like to present you an effort that we have jointly with the University of Toronto regarding a research project, a European Union US project on hybrid uh, and intercontinental experimentation. Of course, uh, given the expertise of uh, University of Toronto in hybrid uh, experimentation, I understand that it, it is not the topic of this talk to give you the basics or some details uh, regarding the, um, the concept behind the hybrid experiments, um, real-time hybrid simulation, but I'm gonna, just for the sake of the, for just for clarity, I would like to give you some brief introduction on the topic so that you can uh, then follow up what is the advance that we try to do through our project. Okay, so you know very well that uh, whenever we have um, uh, a seismic scenario with a seismic input, basically an earthquake engineering related problem as an excitation, then we develop a number of numerical tools or experimental methods to assess something. This something typically is the performance of the structure because we want to either understand the physics of the physical phenomenon or we'd like to predict the response of a particular component or a particular system under this excitation. So ultimately we're driving horizontally from the seismic scenario to seismic performance, but in this case we are trying to do this by joining forces, joining numerical analysis with experimental campaigns. Typically there is a loop between all these issues. We have developed our substructures which all together assemble the system that we're trying to, to, to resolve, to study. And we have uh, something that coordinates the analysis, coordinates the whole thing, a coordinating software, which can be one of the few that uh, they, they exist in the, uh, in the industry and, or in, in the business if you like. And then we have our numerical solution, our numerical model, this finite element idealization, where we typically, is where we start from, we apply forces to a numerical model and then through the control system, we uh, get the, uh, the forces and the displacements of the numerical solution to the physical substructure. Then the loop is uh, further moves to measuring the forces and the displacements of the experiment, of the system that we're testing physically, and then we go to the next step. This is the loop that goes for each time step, and we exchange information between what we model, let's say, computationally, and what we test physically. Of course, there are uh, uh, infinite combinations of uh, uh, systems that we can subtract in many, many different ways. But in all cases, then we need to handle this uh, large amount of data, uh, which are related to the way we visualize our results, the way we store our results, the way that we share our results, the protocols of communication, which are very important in, in this case, and also some issues that are related to the scenario or to the, to the earthquake related problem that we study, which are dealing with, as we're going to talk later on in the second lecture, with intensity measures, like the ways in which we describe what this excitation is, and then engineering demand parameters, which is what we measure at the end. Because we need to make some predictions, we need to understand, we measure something. So this something is typically an engineering demand parameter. Then this coordinating software could be any of these three primary, let's say, families of tools. Professor Kwon is the developer of uh, the most, uh, let's say, widely used uh, and the one that we use in our, in our uh, research project as well. Uh, so these are three different protocols which have their own pros and cons and um, essentially do the work of exchanging information between the physically represented components and the numerically represented components. Then the basics are that, I don't know how familiar you are or whether you do this in the course or you have uh, explained some basic concepts, should I go through it or not? Very, very briefly maybe. Okay, are there any familiar at all? Some of them. Yeah. Some of them, okay, very, very briefly. I'll try to simplify. Maybe uh, simplify too much. The whole thing is that we, we substructure the system into smaller systems that communicate between them through their dynamic, their dynamic degrees of freedom. Most of these slides are from the manual of the UI SimCore, which are, we're going to talk later on further. The whole thing is that in the framework of this substructuring, these are the dynamic degrees of freedom of the system, which can be solved separately and statically to contribute to the formulation of the stiffness matrix. So we have 
exchange of information through this dynamic decrease of freedom and the, any coordinating software or the SIMCore or the other two as well essentially uh, uh, run this uh, the, time, the time integration and coordinate the analysis within the, their engine involving only the effective degrees of freedom as all the rest are sold separately. So having done this, we split our structure and we exchange forces and displacements as I said previously in a way that uh, I guess that you are, uh, as I said, uh, some of you are already familiar. This is a tool that you can download free from the web and these are the, let's say, the software that communicate with a particular uh, coordinating software. Now, uh, as we all understand, the, the natural flow of research went from making a system, a test on a simple component of a system, and then utilizing remote, let's say, resources or remotely located labs to run a hybrid experiment, like subtracting something here and there, but the first first step was to have computers nearby and to exchange information between the test we had here and the nearby computers. So let's say the, the, the step of hybrid experimentation by distributing facilities all over a continent, as it is the case in the US, is the physical continuation of this concept. In our case, we have to deal with an intermediate step, which is to use the same approach to run essentially experiments purely numerically, but also geographically distributed. So there is also an intermediate step that we sometimes have to pass through. Now, this analysis coordinator was, as I said, developed at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign by Professor Kwon and um, the group of Professor Nasider, and essentially is one of the three protocols to coordinate remotely these experiments. Now, examples for purely numerical approach, purely numerical applications are the one that is shown in the, in the paper cited here, and also a couple of examples I'm going to show you here. I'm not going to go through the integration scheme, because you can find this. This is also the concept that we're going to talk about in the framework of our project, because particularly in this project, we are dealing with four bridges. And the system that we're substructuring into different components are essentially the, a bridge, a given bridge that we have in Greece, and we're going to split it, as you see, in a numerical part and an experimental part, not the one that you see here. I'm going to talk later on. And then we will proceed with the cyclic flow. Now, what would be the reason, one could possibly ask, this is also your slide, what should be the reason for splitting a system into different substructures and solve it purely numerically? Why is that? The, the first thing that comes to our mind is that it, with the, the capacity of the computers that we have now, there's no reason. Actually, we can run anything in OpenSys, an integrated system with its, let's say, its three-dimensional represented uh, bug fill and uh, embankment and everything. Is there any reason to split the system into different computers? One, one reason, obviously, is that some software are specialized in different aspects of structural geotechnical response. So maybe it is a good idea to combine different software. I think that this was the first idea behind uh, using this for purely numerical purposes. The other is that we can utilize the capacity of different computers to invert smaller matrices around instead of inverting the, the entire matrix of a very huge and very heavy finite element model. So having done that, it is quite useful to try to play a little bit with different combinations to see whether we have any, um, let's say, advantage by distributing the analysis. Further, one could ask, why should I, instead of utilizing 10 computers in my lab, utilize 10 computers all over the world? I, I create a load on my head, which I don't need it. Why should I do this? Well, I think in this case, the reason that one should do this, it's the case that you, you're using a supercomputer somewhere. Some of these computers, it's not a normal PC, that you, you have so much improvement in the performance by using a specific, let's say, very heavy part of your system to be run there, which overcomes the delay that you have in the communication between the various systems. So I don't say that this is a, uh, let's say an approach that it is optimal for all possible cases that you, you might encounter, 
But there are cases where it is, it is quite useful. Now, let us see a couple of examples um, about uh, two bridges, the one in the US and one in Greece, which we tried as a first step to run by distributing uh, the analysis. The one is um, uh, a, hi um, a highway overpass along the Ignite Highway. So you can have uh, the idea of, of Europe, and Greece is here, as you know. And then Ignatia Highway is essentially the highway that connects the port of Igumanitsa, which is the natural link to Italy, with the borders with uh, Turkey. So essentially, this is, a high, uh, this is a highway which has been, has many, many different features. One feature is that it's very long, and it covers a highly maintenance and seismically active area which make it quite challenging to build bridges there. Bridges are almost, in total, more than 42 kilometers. This highway was accomplished last year. And actually, it's also, from a historical viewpoint, it's aligned along the ancient Roman path of Ignatia. Ignatia, the ancient Ignatia, which should look something like the remains that you see here. And this, this is, a, let's say, the modern uh, equivalent. <laughs> of course, to be honest, the distance between the ancient and the, the new Ignatia is not always that close, but I picked this picture because it uh, makes a good impression. But uh, ultimately, it drives from, the, the, let's say, the west part to the eastern part of northern Greece. These are some slides of, of bridges that have been, down, that have been constructed there. To, to get an idea about the seismicity that this highway is crossing, it's the design uh, peak ground acceleration is, let's, let's say, 0.24 g. So it's not negligible. It's not the highest in Greece. We also have 0.36, but 0.24 is quite challenging. And you can see that sometimes these bridges are quite long, or they're, they're crossing very steep mountains. Um, they typically have two branches for the two directions of the traffic. And um, they're built with main, many different uh, construction and design techniques. Most of them are following the Greek code for bridges, but let's say this was something like 90% of the Eurocode. Eurocode 8, uh, part two for bridges. So very, very similar to the Eurocode 8 design. Now, the bridge that we tried to first solve uh, through this um, approach was a highway overcrossing with uh, three spans of total length of 60 meters. So you can imagine that we uh, subassembled this bridge into its substructures. You can see the deck, middle piers, there is a pile group foundation. I'm not going to the details of the bridge. So the first thing that one tried to see was to start from scratch. Like, I have a bridge, and I typically have it fixed. And then I develop a better model, where I introduce soil structure interaction in the simplest way possible. Simplest way being, let's say, to introduce a set of springs and dashboards, six degrees of freedom springs and dashboards, to account for the dynamic impedance, that is, the dynamic damping and uh, stiffness. And let's say that this is model number one, and then at the edges of the, let's say, at the supports near the abutments, we can fit in a simple Caldrans type, let's say, linear equation. So this would be the simplest model that we would do. And maybe introducing the, the damping is not the simplest possible model, but let's say this is a standard that we would, that we would do and introduce a pile group stiffness according to the literature. Then we have also our own tool that we generate. Maybe th this is why we consider that this is the simple possible case, because we have our tool to develop this uh, kinds of uh, dynamic impedance matrices. And then we have um, a second model where we have reproduced physical, not physically, but the entire, let's say, abutment and pile group of the uh, embankment and embankment system, also supported on springs. And then this was the third equivalent, like to introduce the entire 3D soil domain of the embankment and the, amb the embankment and the abutment, but not in three-dimensional form, the foundation properties at the middle piers. This remained as previously, and you can see some slides of uh, the three-dimensional model and the acceleration. And so this is considered to be, let's say, the third model. And the fourth model, oops, sorry. The fourth model was uh, the substructure model result with the distributed computing approach. So we splitted this system, as you can imagine, by, let's say, introducing three main substructures, one for the left um, embankment, two for the second embankment, and the structure was represented 
as and sold in open seas, where all the rest were, were, were sold in Abacus. This was one of the advantages I was talking to, that maybe one wouldn't like to use open seas for the abandonment, so you use another sort. Now, the second bridge, which is more interesting because it was the second that we tried for, was a bit more challenging because although it has been extensively studied in the literature, it's a Meloland over crossing bridge. Yep. Hundreds of papers have been written about this. But the interesting thing that the, is that the, uh, we tried to see the effect of soil liquefaction of the overall response that we're measuring. So this is also um, a work that has been done by Professor Kwon. But in this case, we tried it a little bit differently. So we will substructure the bridge again. But this time, the excitation won't be applied directly at the base of the structure. We will, fi we will find scenarios to be applied at the level of the bedrock. And we propagate the motion with and without considering or not considering the liquefaction effect. This, of course, will lead to an entirely different response in the end, as we're going to see in a minute. So we are selecting some ground motions, and we are going to consider the case where we ignore soil structure interaction, but we still propagate ground motion in a side response analysis, like a shake type or, a, um, or any of this kind but without considering the liquefaction effect. And then we may have soil structure interaction, yes, but no liquefaction. And then we have soil structure interaction considering liquefaction uh, um, at the system. And then we have a fourth case where liquefaction is only locally introduced at the middle pier. Because clearly we understand that we don't have a contract with the soil that liquefaction will extend equally and identically along uh, the structure. So it is much probable that the soil formations which are weaker at the middle of the pier, at the middle of the pier or are more prone, or they have some, some materials, sandy materials that are prone to liquefaction, appear to be uh, liquefaction susceptible, liquefy actually, only in the middle of the pier. So this is the fourth case. And then we select ground motions. The problem here is, is that you need to find motions that can be reasonably applied on the bedrock. So you cannot go and pick ground motions like recorded on soil C or soil D, according to the US codes or the European codes, you need either motions recorded on the bedrock or generate some motions artificial on your own that correspond to the conditions of a bedrock because you want to propagate. Of course, you always have the option to, to take a record that you rec recorded somewhere with some soil and deconvolute it down to the bedrock and then come up again. But this means that you need to know the exact soil profile of the place you recorded. At any rate, we split the motion into recorded and artificial ground motions. And then you can see the difference between, let's say, the case, this is the wave propagation analysis, so including liquefaction effect. You can see uh, shear stress, shear strain response. You can see the development of excess pore water pressure. These are the sandy layers, the sandy uh, layers at uh, the particular levels. You can see the shear strains which are maximized exactly at these particular layers. And then we run, or we have, before running the entire fragility analysis, we need to do something that we are, there is no other way. It is to avoid using the very heavy finite element model, even the substructure one, because we're running fragility analysis with a very large number of analysis, and it would take ages to run fragility analysis with a model that takes hours to be solved. So we calibrate. The, let's say the simplified model, which is based on the three-dimensional finite element model, we calibrate a simpler model on this one. And then we will run substructure analysis with a simplified model where the, the stiffness of the abutment embankment system is represented by the spring. This is much faster in terms of system stiffness. It's quite reliable. So we, we do this. And we can see that the comparison between the multi-platform and the single, the simplified uh, platform analysis is okay. The, these are verification tests. By comparing the one uh, side response analysis software with the other side response analysis, we get similar results and we're happy with this. What is more important to, to observe here, though, is that if, let's say, we have our bridge here, the bedrock here, we apply ground motion here, this is the soil profile, and we propagate upwards, and the left side is the inelastic response of the soil structure system, of the pier in this case 
without considering liquefaction or considering liquefaction, this makes a very, very big difference. And the reason, of course, is that liquefaction applies an acceleration cutoff, as we know, because soil becomes liquid and it cannot transmit shear waves anymore. So from this point of view, it will always happen, as we'll see in the results, that this response is beneficial, one would say. So it liquefies, we have lower ground motion intensity. We're happy with this. Of course, this is not exactly true, because we also have displacements. We have uh, settlements. We have deferencing settlements. We have other kinds of damage, which are not measurable in the way that we measure now. At any rate, we have two different predictions, assessments, depending on whether we have a considered liquefaction or not. And of course, this is reflected in the fragility, not that much, let's say, for the low uh, damage limit state, because then the whole system, the, the, the whole approach is that not, uh, do not make a, a much of a difference. But as we progress, we will see that going to, let's say, uh, damage state two, soil structure interaction effects, of course, seem relatively less important, primarily due to the moderate average soil stiffness compared to the introduction of liquefaction, because as an order of magnitude, liquefaction affected ground motion much more. And what is more interesting to notice is that when we move to limit state three, the bridge for which we consider the liquefaction effect does not collapse, never, ever. If you uh, excite it with 10 times higher acceleration, does not, it's not transmitted. So this clearly is a false representation of the problem. Independently, if you like, I'm talking now physically, not, not from the point of view of the analysis that we do. Whatever analysis that we do, this gives you a false perception of what's happening in the bridge. So in this case, we had uh, also introduced different damage indices related to other kinds of damage, like lateral soil displacement damage indices or foundation rotation, pile bending failure. Also, you can have excessive shear at some level of the pile due to the liquefaction. This is damage. You cannot ignore it. And then you assign some uh, limit states and um, some, some values, and you end up with a totally different fragility. But this is not the topic of this, of this purpose. It is, uh, let's say, a scientific outcome of the multi-platform analysis that was, I was talking about. But I have to put a full stop here and return to our main topic. Now, what has been done so far regarding US and EU cooperation? There are some things that are going on one very important project was a project called Ceres. It's a project that uh, has been running by the University of Patras, involving 23 institutions, which I'm going to show you uh, in a moment. Essentially, it is like, like the equivalent of Nice in Europe, somehow. But it is not um, run in the way Nice runs its facilities. Because this is a project. This is not a, a, a framework. At any rate, most of the 23rd uh, most important facilities in Europe are connected. And also there is a cooperation with the uh, uh, US and, the J and Japan. And the participants are all have a very important uh, facility, either centrifuge or shaking table or any kind of large scale facility. It's only for large scale facilities, which have, they, are, they are running experiments, not all with all, but some with some. So it is, let's say, the first step to run hybrid simulations in Europe. And then there is also the small niche, the UK niche um, uh, foundation, if you like, in the UK, which involves the blade. This is the laboratory of the University of Bristol with a laboratory in Oxford and the nice centrifuge in Cambridge. So these are three facilities that also develop their own protocols to communicate uh, with each other. So these are the three most important, if you like, equivalents to NIS that run now in Europe. Clearly, Europe is one or two steps behind. Maybe this is why one of the reasons that some effort has been, been put by all sides to bridge this gap. And um, one effort has been to try to run some experiments involving both the US and some European partners. To the best of my knowledge, there has only been two intercontinental experiments before the, the, the third that we tried to, to do. But there, there, are, there is some success which I need to, to refer to. One is an effort between UC Berkeley and the University of Cassel. This is from their website. And actually, they have tested 
this device here, this is a dumping device, and they have tried to investigate what were the problems of communication, because now we're coming to our topic, expanding this content, con concept between two continents brings the issue of communication. Because otherwise, the concept would work the same if you have the same protocol and the same tools. But this is a very important issue. They also have to deal with some, uh, some um, uh, delays. Um, and also there is an effort that has been done in Taiwan, between Taiwan and the US. But I don't have it recorded to display it to you. So this brings us to the topic of our paper, our, let's say, project, which is to investigate the potential to run experimental and computational uh, experiments between, first of all, European partners, and then between European partners, the partners of the project, and the uh, North American ones, with the purpose to identify, as a physical problem, the effect of soil structure interaction on bridge systems. Now, this is the website of the um, project where we upload uh, what we do. And basically, you can see that we essentially connect the Saloniki, which is our historical university here, with what you will see will be tested at the University of Patras here, with uh, a numerical, numerically represented module in Naples, Italy, with uh, a piece, again a numerical represented module in Geodermic Structure in Paris. This is an industrial partner, a company. And then we have the uh, University of Toronto, which we are delighted to be here today, and the University of Illinois, uh, represented by Professor Amr El Nasai. So it is about Thessaloniki by myself. Professor Bushes and Professor Fardis from Patras, Professor Manfredi and Professor uh, Di Sarno from Naples, Professor Alain Pecker from France, Professor Kwon and Professor Nasai. Uh, clearly, this is not something that you can run a hybrid experiment just like that in day one. So it took us two years and a half to be where we are, which I'm going to show you. And we have one year and a half to do <laughs> what we have promised. So we will judge in the future. The objectives, of course, is to find um, a decent case study and divide it into several modules, perform pseudo-dynamic testing. Some of them will be represented numerically, some physically. Utilize um, the, the resources that we have and uh, present the collaborative uh, test among uh, the various institutions. Now, we have these key components of what we're going to do with subtraction and the algorithm and all, but also please notice these components. The one is the, the, there are a few challenges in this. One is that we are running a system where the physical part is a bearing. This makes it, of course, as we're talking, it's an elastomeric bearing, which is not as strain rate dependent, but still it is somehow. So we cannot wait forever for a force to be there, because the algorithm needs to compensate for the delay. So we have a limit, a red line, of the delay that we can accept. And between Greece and Toronto, this delay is not as much as between Greece and Patras, unfortunately. So this makes a difference. And it also changes our, our, our decisions, as you're, as you're going to see. The second is that it will be the first time that we'll, we'll run, or we hope to run, a test between six partners from five countries and two continents. So OK, we started from the simplest possible condition, which would be to run this experiment purely numerically, okay, by choosing our initial bridge, which is again a real overpass. And then this is just to have an idea, the, the bearings and the pile groups and the geometry, the topology of the bridge. And this is the deck and the span and all. And then we substructure this bridge to run it first numerically to see what the, what the, the feasibility, if you like, of the approach and to foresee, to extrapolate this knowledge towards the hybrid experiment. So we have, as you, you see here, split the bridge by identifying its dynamic components. Let's say we run SIMCOR in Thessaloniki for, for start. Okay, so the analysis coordinated from Thessaloniki as the first scenario. And then we have the abutment and embankment system running at the computer in Illinois. This is a computer. This now is a computer in Patras resembling the bearing. And this is a peer, again, uh, this should be also numerically. Now, as, as, okay, again, 
This is a peer below the tested bearing, which is numerically represented, which is in Naples, but the bearing is now numerical, it will be physical. And we also have the dynamic degrees of freedom of this system running in uh, the University of Toronto. So you can have a snapshot here of the preparatory works which took place in Patras. First, the first thing that they do is to run simple tests on the device, on the, on the bearing, to get the properties, to see their properties. They have set up the preparatory works. Of course, they have other pro projects also running, so they do this in parallel. And they see the effect of strain rate, they, and do also hybrid tests with other institutions within Europe, very selectively, little by little. And then, of course, they also tried uh, two different approaches to test the communication of their own control and hardware, because clearly these are systems that uh, inherently it is very difficult to, to run in the same manner all over the world with all the protocols, all the devices, all the software that have the control systems. Uh, so they have to resolve some of their own problems regarding communication, and they have developed a soft approach and a hard approach to connect to the other devices using uh, different protocols in each case. We have also set up our own system, which is there waiting to run the heaviest part of the model in different combinations, which is our, our server in uh, its own VPN uh, software, this high-performance system that we developed last year. And this is where we run our analysis. This is the video that at least works and shows how the analysis is run. This is the UI uh, UC component. This is the Naples component. This is Patras. This is Toronto. And it is only the analysis that runs in Thessaloniki. And then, of course, we tried all different combinations because we thought that maybe it makes a difference. Clearly here, it is not obvious in advance whether there is an optimal scenario in terms of substructuring and, and which this, this scenario is. So, okay, this is a, an agreement between the a holistic approach where everything is modeled in open seas and, let's say, the substructure one. But coming again to what I was saying, it is not obvious which is the optimum scenario. So we try to see what is the, what is the feasibility, of course, and what is, let's say, what, what affects the analysis that we do in terms of different criteria. So one criterion was, for instance, what is the, the, the time that takes for a time step and the time that takes for an, an, the entire experiment? Now, in this case, it, it seems if we plot, let's say, very, very crudely, very approximately, um, different combinations where we run, let's say, everything in Thessaloniki, but just one, just one component in Thessaloniki, which is the fastest one, then we send this component to Patras, which is the closest one. So if we, we plot it with distance, and then we we replace this and we set it up in, Pat in uh, Naples and then we set it in here, the University of Toronto and then in uh, Illinois. What we notice here is that of course it is not the total time, it's the time step time that matters, but at any rate, if we ping, even if we ping a simple set of, a simple package of data from Thessaloniki to different parts of the world, it is seen that 50% of the latency, that is the delay in pinging, comes when crossing the Atlantic. So because you can trace it, you trace from Thessaloniki, goes, I don't know, to Amsterdam, then to Frankfurt, or may make some circles a couple of times in Europe, and then goes through the Atlantic. Through the Atlantic is 50% of the time. And I'm not quite sure how, in the way it is now, this can be reduced substantially. Of course, there are some ideas we're talking about, but th this is one, one issue that we have seen it is not that you can reduce the hops. We have five to six hops. Hops is like stations between the sneak signal passes the Atlantic. But even if you, you, you bring it down to half, this would make a reduction of half 50%, which would be 25%. So there is, a, there is a latency in crossing the Atlantic. And of course, we, the only thing that we need to do now is to try different techniques and then maybe just drop it a little bit below the red line of the experiment. So if we match this, which at the time I think we exceed by 50%, but if we manage to drop it a little bit down, it would become more feasible. And then these are the combinations where you can have, you can see here different combinations. This is the total analysis. Of course, as I said, total analysis, 
doesn't mean anything because we might have a record which takes uh, one year to run. You see, it is uh, endless. So it is not the total. But at any rate, you can have an idea of the fluctuation by interchanging positions. Like we run some analysis and the abutment is in Greece and another analysis and the abutment is, I don't know, in Italy. So there is a variation of the response. And again, there is an issue of time zone. Because if you repeat the experiment, there are times of the day where the, the traffic is higher. This seems to be very much related to the US, which has the heaviest traffic among uh, the other partners. But again, there is some fluctuation. So one could possibly spot the times of the day where the delay, the latency, would be lower. And then, of course, if you, if you split, let's say, the time spent uh, within a, in total or within a time step, you, we noticed that in our particular case, the not working time was 70% of the overall time spent. But this is also very much related on the particular intensity you're running. Because if you're, it's entirely different if your analysis is linear elastic or nonlinear. Because if it is nonlinear, the, the time it takes for the finite elements to resolve the particular uh, numerical module is higher. So for low intensity earthquakes or excitations, the networking time is the critical. And then, of course, there is an issue of uh, module co coordination and handling, like transferring uh, in and out information. And some finite element analysis, at this case, was low because we, we, we kept it low. But one thing that we did, what that we learned from this, until we, we uh, reduced somehow the time, the networking time, was that we said, well, why should we then, uh, since we tried to reduce, ground mo the, reduce the time, why shouldn't we choose another bridge where at least the nonlinear response of the bearing will not be as excessive? So in this case, oh, sorry for the Greek title, but the idea is that we picked another overpass of Ignatia where we have only bearings at the, the abutments. So since the monolithic uh, pier, middle piers resist the majority of seismic forces, this means that these uh, bearings are not as highly uh, stressed. And we are working on this bridge now, where we put the same approach. We have adapted the experimental facility to run the particular bearings and not the previous ones that we were working. And of course, we have run everything in OpenSys again, waiting there. We have modeled the analytical part is the easy part, I think. It's not, a, it's not an issue to develop and run it. And this is purely nonlinear, and this is represented by springs and dashboards. And uh, again, we have also run the abutment and embankment system to identify the stiffness of the system and the transverse and the longitudinal direction. And we have, so with these slides, I, I conclude the intercontinental hybrid experiment uh, contractually is to be delivered next year. So we have some time. I think we started from scratch. The experience that we gained, at least it's quite useful. The help we got from uh, Professor Kwan, the University of Toronto was enormous. And also from all partners, particularly I would like to mention Stathis Bushias, Professor Bushias, and Professor Anasai. And we're confident that starting from scratch, we have stepped somewhere, and let's hope that we'll manage to accomplish it in the end. So that's the, the end of the first part uh, before the lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.